to give a big shout out to uh, community health workers, to peers, to outreach workers, uh, to community health representatives across our tribal nations. I wanna thank you for your service uh, during this pandemic um, and this profound time of economic and social unrest. But of course, you know that you've been doing this work long before. In fact, the origins of our CHW profession uh, don't just go back decades, but in the United States, they go back hundreds of years. And I wanna honor um, your service to community, your commitment to a culturally aligned approach and your commitment to social justice. The National Association was founded in November, 2019 to unite our very diverse profession, again, across race, ethnicity, uh, lived experience, uh, sector. Um, and we are coming together to support our communities to achieve health, equity, and social justice. So I have some wonderful friends that I'm meeting for the first time today who are going to present uh, on this webinar. Um, but before we get uh, to this great presentation, I wanna toss it to Bernadine so she can share some important updates with you. Uh, Bernadine, please go ahead. Thank you, Denise. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Bernadine Mavungu Daringama and I am based in Brooklyn, New York, and I am NATRA Senior Communications Associate, um, and I'm happy to be sharing in space with you all. And today, I just want to announce something great. So I would like to announce uh, officially our Unity Conference 2022. Uh, the date for this has now been set for Wednesday, August the 3rd to Thursday the 4th of this year. And this is a virtual event. So we will be going fully virtual this year. Uh, if you've never heard of the conference, what is the Unity Conference? It is the annual meeting, an interactive event of the National Association of Community Health Workers. And it's designed for our CHWs and ally members making a difference. Um, this is a wonderful event where you get to um, share in fellowship with other CHWs and allies, share best practices, uh, participate in a lot of workshops. We have many, many workshops um, and really hear what is happening on the ground. And then we also have some really great speakers. At uh, last year's event, we had over 800 registrants and we are looking to surpass that this year. We also had 70 plus speakers and co-presenters, the vast majority of whom are CHWs. Uh, we also had 30 workshops and roundtables, and some roundtables are led by our board members and include topics such as policy, lots of you know research, great things, and then we also have networking over Slack, um, and so this is where CHWs and participants get to share what they're doing, some great events they've been hosting, and ask each other some questions as well. Uh, this year's theme is CHWs, the past, present, and future of community care. We will be highlighting the work of CHWs in the past, the work they are doing today, and looking forward to the future. So you can visit our Unity website, which is www.nachuaunity.org. That's N-A-C-H-W-Unity.org. And on this webpage, you will see general information and also a link to our current uh, sponsorship prospectus. If you would like to become a sponsor or you know of an organization that you think would be a great fit to sponsor this conference, please share our webpage with them. They can take a look, read through, and there is contact information in there. Having sponsors allows us to offer things like language transcription. We really want to make this accessible. And so we will be offering tr live transcription as well as translation in different languages. We also will help sponsor that Slack networking channel. We will also for the first time this year be offering continuing education credits. Um, and then we will have a My, CH, My Story, My CHW Story video a board induction ceremony. So this is exciting. If you are in attendance and a member in good standing, you get to vote in live on that day, new board members onto the Nachual board. And then we celebrate with a ceremony uh, as well as the first at least 200 <laughs> registrants get a gift box or a swag box, which has some wonderful branded items in there, which are great for self-care as well. Sponsors will be co-branded. Uh, they will also be included in all of our marketing. 
And so please, if you know anyone, please share that webpage link with them as well. So I look forward to seeing you all at Unity. It's going to be a, another great year. It's completely virtual. Again, that's August 3rd to the 4th. So see you there. Oh, and dates for registration, ticket prices, all of that will be coming in the following weeks. So please keep an eye out, follow us on social media. If you're not receiving our newsletter, sign up for our newsletter so you can be the first to know when we announce all of that information. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bernadine. Um, Peter, thanks for continuing to let people in. Um, I wanna recognize Michaela Trujillo and Nasha Chaudhuri, uh, both staff members who are with us today. I wanna recognize Lucy Wynn, uh, one of our national leaders who is with us today. Um, and so many others, just thank you uh, again. So without further ado, I wanna go ahead and get started um, with the presentation. And I want to uh, just first uh, recognize Dr. Omar Ba, um, who is a, a gentleman I've really wanted to uh, connect with more in the past couple of years. Uh, we met briefly, I believe in 20, 20, no, 2019, uh, we were both uh, moving forward in our fellowship as uh, community and cultural health leaders. Um, and I knew he was doing great things in Rhode Island and thought, let me just stay connected because something amazing is happening there. Uh, I wanna thank all of his uh, staff and team uh, who are here today, and they're going to introduce themselves and a little bit about the Dream Center uh, hailing out of Rhode Island. So first, let me just uh, bring forward uh, Dr. Omar Ba and then Rakia Islam will go ahead and introduce the team. So actually, um, so it seems like Omar had to step out, unfortunately. Okay, that's he's, perfect. He's, he is an he's amazing Rakia. person, he's up to many amazing things, um, but I definitely echo hit the sentiment that it's an, an absolute honor to stay connected to you, Denise, um, and to be here today. Um, but we do have amazing colleagues to, to follow in his place. Um, also, happy National Public Health Week. I think that's a great opportunity for organizations like ours and other community members to speak up um, and talk about very important issues around healthcare access and et cetera. Um, so I'm Rakia Islam. I am the Deputy Director at Refugee Dream Center. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization based in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, we serve about more than 2,200 uh, refugees and immigrants in the community. We were founded by, I call them a power couple, Omar and Teddy. So Omar is the big name, but Teddy Jallo here is also the co-founder and she does a lot. Um, so I'm, I'm so happy to introduce all of our co my colleagues here. Um, so I think I'll go ahead and, and do that. So Teddy, please take the, full, take the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rakia, for the introduction. Um, welcome, everyone, and we are so happy to be here. And I am. My name is Teddy Jallo. I am a refugee from the Gambia. I am also the co-founder of Refugee Dream Center, and I am now the executive director also of the Refugee Dream Center. I will be. I will. I will be the one presenting today. So. Okay, I think I'll pass it on to someone, maybe Isabel. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Isabel Kayembe. I'm a refugee from Angola. I arrived in the United States in 2015. And uh, I'm the case manager and the community health worker at the Refugee Dream Center. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Isabel. Um, Ziada? Yes, um, hi everybody. I'm Ziad Alias, uh, community health worker and uh, the case manager at the Refugee Dream Center, also an interpreter. I am a former refugees, refugee from Iraq. Um, I arrived to the United States, Providence, Rhode Island in 2018. Um, thank you for having me. And I will pass it on to Mohibi. Hello, everyone. My name is Mohibi. Um, I'm from Afghanistan. I recently came here um, in the process of evacuated that happened in Afghanistan, the revolution. 
So uh, I'm so happy that I work uh, with the Refugee Dream Center. I joined with them recently, and it is almost six months that I'm here in Rhode Island. And I connected with a lot of people here. Thank you for uh, TD and Dr. Omar Baha that they have finished, um, um, created an organization that's called Refugee Dream Center that they connect all the people. So I'm happy to uh, work with these guys here. Thank you so much for you guys. And finally, we have Chantal. Hi, everyone. My name is Fortunara Chantal Kasika. I'm a refugee from Democratic Republic of Congo. I've been in refugee camp in Tanzania for 21 years. I arrived in Rhode Island in 2017, and I've been working with Refugee Dream Center as a volunteer and breaking barrier. Thank you. Thank you to everyone uh, coming from the Refugee Dream Center. I'm, I'm thrilled and honored to have you all. So thank you in advance. I'm gonna go ahead and advance your slides and I look forward to your presentation. Go ahead. So um, we just have like um, a little bit of a slide that summarize what is going on, what, what a refugee is and uh, the number of refugees or, and also the number of displaced people that we have around the world. As you can see here, we have numbers. Um, we have 26 million refugees around the world, according to UNHCR. And we have 5.6 million Palestinian refugees under the also UN um, mandate, CR mandate, and also 45.7 million internally displaced people. And internally displaced people can um, are people, for example, like um, the war in Ukraine right now, people are running and they are going to their neighboring countries. And some of them, the UNHCR will not be able to count everybody. So those are the people that we call internally displaced and also within their, their countries sometimes where the war is not and people will run to the side. We can go to the next slide. This is the definition of a refugee, what a refugee is and the difference between a refugee and what an immigrant. A refugee is forced to leave their country because of war or persecution or reason of race, religion. It can be race, it can be religion, it can be anything. For example, I became a refugee because my husband was a journalist and he was um, writing things like about human humanity and the government doesn't like it. Um, he, we had a dictator who ruled the Gambia for 22 years. He was torturing and killing. And he was writing that. He was exposing all the dirty things that the government was doing. And one day he was wanted, he had to leave the country and I was, I had to stay. But I was under some sort of house arrest for three years before I left the Gambia. That's how I became a refugee. Unable or owing to such fear is unwilling to return home. Refugees, when you leave your country, you don't wanna go back because of what is in your country, unless it is not there anymore. I will give myself again an example. I came here in 2009. I could not go back until 2017 because the government was still there. So if I, I, I was, I had like, um, I became a US um, citizen, but still I could not go back to Gambia because the government, the dictator was still there. So he left in 2017, then I was able to go back. We can go to the next slide. So deeper immigrants, immigrants, an immigrant is somebody who planned 
to leave his or her country. Like you have, you planned your journey. You say, okay, if you are from the Gambia, you say, I'm going to the US. You have to get a, um, a passport. You have to get a pocket money. You have to get a visa in order to come to the United States. You can also choose to return back when you go. We can go to the next slide. An asylee, what is an asylee? An asylee is just also like the immigrant. You planned your journey to travel, but is the, when you get there, it's like, again, the refugee, the fear of going back home. Something is stopping you from going back home. Whether it's your religion, whether it's your ethnicity, or whether it's your government, you cannot go back home because of the fear that you have to go back home. Like many Gambian, Gambian women, sometimes when they travel, they, don't, they apply for asylum due to um, women's circumcision. It's very common in some of the um, culture, people in the Gambia, not everybody, but many of them do circumcision on women and it's not a good thing. We can go to the next slide. So this is like the typical refugee. The war, like something happened and then you just run. You carry whatever you have. As you can see, this kid is carrying something like clothes in a bag. So he's, they are just running, running for their lives. So when you are running, whatever is next to you, that's what, whatever you can carry, that's what you carry to run. We can go to the next. And yep, these are refugees um, running through the forest. This is the journey of a refugee. And every refugee also have their own journey run through the same difficult journey. As you can see, they are, in the, they are running for their lives in the forest running, or maybe like what we see in Afghanistan, people were running to the airport to force themselves in an airplane to, to leave. So these are the stories of refugees. This is a refugee camp. So this is the typical camp. People leave, some people will live here like for years, for years, um, like 10 years or more, or some people, some kids actually were born in these camps and they grow up in these camps before they are resettled in any other country. Because not all refugees are resettled in the United States or other countries. The United States resettle refugees, but just a little percent of it, of the refugees around the world. If this is a camp. They use like clothes and bags to have tents. So they will be able to live under these tents. And you have health sanitation problems and uh, people get sick, they don't have good running water, not good toilet. So living here is, is just beyond imaginable, but people live in these camps. We can go to the next slide. This is Syria. Um, they are crossing the Mediterranean um, also, so this is, you see this in Jordan, you see this in the news, you see it everywhere, people die in the, people, they use like boats, plastic boats to cross the sea. So most of them die actually before crossing. So it's the same journey, um, story that refugees have. We can go to the next slide. So this is Refugee Dream Center. Refugee Dream Center is a post-resettlement services. We, we picked up from where the agencies that bring refugees stop. When these agencies bring refugees, they work with refugees for a number of months, for example, like three months or four months. And you don't expect a family from another country who doesn't speak English, or even if you can speak English, you come to the United States and 
three months you are you are done or you picked up or you are self-sufficient that is impossible as a refugee myself i know how it is so hard I, when i came to the united states i could speak little english and i could write and i found my husband here who could speak and write english it was so difficult for me so how about the other refugees so to, through our own experience, that's how the Refugee Dream Center started. That's how we built the Refugee Dream Center because people need the continuation services that we offer here. We can go to the next slide. We had a video, so maybe this video explains a little bit of the Refugee Dream Center. Maybe you wanna play it. Oh, the room is not coming up. There's no audio? Yeah, the audio is not coming up. We are not available for refugees. We are Perfect. missing. We are uh, just uh, a, a gap in the trajectory for refugees to properly integrate into American society. And uh, uh, programs such as ESL, English uh, as a second language for adult uh, English classes, uh, a lot of refugees, once they arrive, they get jobs and then they get stuck in the system, they cannot go to school. So we learned a class that can happen at times that people are out of work and they can come in and learn. So that is a way of filling gaps for people we've seen, people who've been here for five, six years. And generally, the, the way the U.S. refugee resettlement process goes, refugees are supported just for a just for some months when they arrive in the country just for a few months um some six months maybe eight months or sometimes even less and you are on your own it is just practically impossible for any refugee to be uh integrated even if you come speaking english to be integrated fully into american society in six months that's just impossible that's our mantra that's why we call ourselves post resettlement agency we pick up from where the federally funded agencies are take, uh, they, where they stop and we, we continue from there for as long as the person needs help. We, we distributed so, hundreds of boxes of food and baskets of food supply, uh, cleaning supplies, and then also help uh, dozens of individuals with unemployment benefits application and then help people with their interpreting needs in the hospitals or doctor's appointments, virtual doctor's appointment. So literally the refugee dreams and the act as a buffer between the people locked in their homes and also the outside world. Our involvement was a, a buffer to create the safety net and the support needed and, and also the, the kind of uh, 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 backup that even providers who are outside the refugee service industry are involved needed us to, to help us help that kind of interaction between them and the refugee community. It takes patience, it takes cultural attunement and cultural humility, it takes uh, a crafting uh, methods to steadily and simply uh, address uh, uh, interventions in, in supporting the refugee community to, to understand certain things without overwhelming them and without also appearing to be condescending to their beliefs and the way, their way of life. So just to pick up um, to where the video stops a little bit to this video talks about what the refugee dream center does. So this is why we built the refugee dream center. It is refugees helping fellow refugees. Based on experience, I know when a refugee from everywhere around the country walks here walks in here and asks for help i know exactly what they need and how best i can help them so we also have a health promotion um 
project um, um, program that we run, the health promotion, we actually teach basic things about health, and we call it we call this program genital health because it is a continuous of journey, like teaching people how to take care of themselves better and how they can understand the American healthcare and even the food, food and nutrition and keep simple thing like getting an appointment. For example, like when I came here from, I'm from the Gambia, I don't know that I need to have a medical doctor who I should go visit maybe every six months. So it was so hard for me actually to go for any appointment because only when I'm sick, and that is for almost every refugee that I have met at the refugee dream center is like that. We only go to the hospital when we are sick, but that is not the case. We need the preventative care. And uh, those are the things that we also teach here at the refugee dream center. We also do drug services and advocacy. Um, many refugees, when they can be, come to the United States, most of them are placed in bad houses, houses that have lead or houses that have mold. So we stand up with them. We advocate for them until they put them in a better home. Or sometimes if we, can, if we have the finance or somebody to support them to rebuild that house or to fix the mole or the lead, we do that. Many kids, many refugee kids have lead poison before, but through our advocacy and through the journey to health that we run here, now many kids don't have lead poison because we train refugees and we teach them what lead is and how to avoid it. We can go to the next slide. Yes, these are the, yeah post resettlement for various part of the world. We serve every refugee around the world. And we are refugees, yep, fellow refugees, helping fellow refugees, trade services and advocacy. Case management, case managers do a lot. This is Isabel and uh, we also run um, a class here, citizenship class uh, where we teach refugees who lived here for like four years coming to five years in order to do their citizenship classes, take their citizenship test and pass it and become a US citizen. Because if you are a refugee, once you become a refugee, you don't belong to any country until you are resettled to a new country. And when we are resettled in the United States, we want to belong. And the first thing we want to do is to get that certificate, the naturalization certificate, which is very difficult. It's so many questions, it's about 100 questions and you have to read them all and know them. So we teach them here all those questions and they, some of them will go and pass. And just recently, actually five people became a US citizen among our refugee community. And you see the sense of pride and joy because we are happy once now you belong to the United States, you can vote. There was actually one person who came and said, for 10 years, I haven't, ne did not vote. So I am so happy and proud that this time I am able to vote. So those are the things we see around. This is our adult education class. We teach English as a second language at the Refugee Dream Center. And sometimes we also match them with mentors where these mentors can help them from home. We can go to the next slide. This is a picture from our health program. We do food and nutrition. Here we are just having the vegetables placed down and see, talk to them. We sometimes we bring doctors or we bring some presenters to tell us the importance of these vegetables. I can take myself again as an example. When I was in the Gambia, when I eat sweets or cake, what we, what we call junk in America is only for the rich people. So when we come to the United States, we are placed in some communities that does not have um, like, sorry, that does not have um, stores that sells vegetables. So we have the corner stores 
And this corner stores don't have any vegetable. All they have is all this canned food and many refugees don't eat canned food or they have what they call, what we call here junk food. And you start eating this junk food. Before you know you have diabetes or you have high blood um, pressure or you have cholesterol and then you start having all these health issues. But, be, but for you, the person eating this, you think now, you know, I have my card, I have my food stamp, I can use it and buy anything I want. This is America, I have free food. But this food is not healthy. And you don't have anybody teaching you that this food is not healthy. So this is why also we have the program of, we, we have the health program and teach people what is healthy and what is not healthy so they can make good choice when it comes to food. This is breaking barriers. Breaking barrier, they are a group of community leaders that works under the Refugee Dream Center. They, we have, we give them stipends. They are not employees, but they are community leaders of different communities. We have Congolese, we have Iraqis, we have Afghanistan, we have the, all the community members. And many times when we have problems, we tend to go to the community leader instead of let's say calling the police or going anywhere because that is our culture. Growing up in the Gambia, like when, when, when you see anybody having, and even husband and wife having any issues like domestic violence or anything, they go to the community leader instead of calling anybody else. The first person to know is the community leader. And the community leader, if the community leader works with us, it will be easier for us to help them so we can extend our services to all these people too. We can go to the next. This is um, the youth program. We have a youth program where we have um, 15, right now actually we have 15 Americans and American youth and 15 refugee youth. American youth used to come to the Refugee Dream Center and um, help mentoring or tutoring the refugee youth. But we realized that they are doing the top-down approach where they are thinking, okay, we are going to teach the refugees. So instead of saying we are going to teach the refugees, they are coming together and learn from each other, both American and the refugee youth. And we also, are, we also have 15 mentors who are um, adults and they are also in the community. The mentor, each mentor is matched with one youth and one refugee, one American youth and one refugee youth. And this mentor can help them mentor them in anything they want to be mentored. This is Lend and this is Muhammad. Lend is a, is a volunteer who help teaches um, citizenship. And Mohammed is a refugee from Syria, and now he is a citizen, American citizen. Community engagement, like the War Refugee Day, sometimes we have we celebrate War Refugee Day every year at the Refugee Dream Center, and we invite all the community members and refugee, the refugees come and celebrate their day. Thank you all for listening to my presentation. If you have any questions, please let me know. Once again, I am Teddy, a refugee from the Gambia. I came here in 2009. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teddy. Um, thank you for sharing the stories of so many um, and just broadening our understanding of the journey um, of uh, refugees to the United States. Um, incredible. I wrote down a number of questions, um, but I also want to invite people to put those questions in the chat. So some people may not know how to raise their hand. Um, if you're on a laptop and you can see the bottom of the Zoom, you'll see the chat box and where the participants are. And then you'll see a little smiley face with a plus that says reactions. If you click on that, you can raise your hand. Um, so I just wanted to, um, uh, to sort of talk about that. 
Also, I'm not sure if Lucy Wynn is still um, with us. Um, she's one of our CHW uh, national leaders. If uh, I think she may have had to pass on, um, but she is in Texas um, and she also has uh, uh, an organization called ACHI, uh, the Austin Asian Community Health uh, Institute that is also serving a number of immigrants and uh, refugees. So I'm gonna um, be looking through, someone said excellent presentation. Thank you for sharing your experiences and for all that you do. Um, and I'd see we have one question from Lorna Osterbach, um, who is another one of our uh, CHW or CHR leaders. Uh, Lorna, would you like to bring forward your question? So I, I'm seeing this and I didn't know that, you know, it was 10 years and stuff. So what if um, having an advocate among the refugees and seeking out individuals that would be willing to be that advocate or that liaison for their people because they speak that language and they could interchange and let it be known the needs, the services, the requirement. Because I was wondering why on earth all those people desired to go all the way back to Ukraine and now I'm getting it because home was safe and they had everything and their lives are just turned upside down and we're only seeing just a very brief glimpse of what they're going through on a daily basis. Yeah, so Lorna, I, I understand oh, that the yeah. Refugee Dream Center and the folks here, Fortunata, Isabel, Suban, Zayada, um, Teddy, that they all had you know, very different lives at home. I mean, maybe each of you can share what were you doing um, before this event happened that eventually brought you to the United States? What, what was it that made you want to um, come here and turn around and help your communities? We would love to just get that insight. Teddy, I know you said that Omar was a journalist, right? And now he's um, building this center. So Suban, Isabel, Sayada, Fortunata, what, what were you all doing at home? Well, I can I can go when when I was in the Gambia, I was with my family. That was the normal life. I never thought of leaving the Gambia. I was married for two months. I never thought I would be separated. We will be separated, me and my husband. So when I knew like his writing and also he knew, but that is him. He was born in the rural village of the Gambia. And I was also born in the rural village of the Gambia where we see so much poverty. I used to walk miles to go to school. Actually, I was the only girl who ever went to school in my family. And I actually was the first person in my family to go to school and graduate and went to nursing school. So this, we live in poverty. So when, when Omar became a journalist, he had every reason to fight for, for his people. Then he started doing journalism where, I'm sorry, calls are coming in. <laughs> oh no, that's okay. We're then getting started, great questions um, into the chat. Let me see if Sayada, Isabel or Suban, if you want to share. Um, tell us a little bit about your life before. Go ahead, Suban. Well, again, everyone, um, my name is, my last name is actually Mohibi. My first name is Suban. I'm from Afghanistan and the capital of Afghanistan, Kabul province. Um, actually, what brought me here in the United States uh, that was a revolution that happened in Afghanistan. You know better in news that uh, Taliban came after 20 years back and they uh, took all Afghanistan. And I was working with the United States with Department of State back home. Um, so there wasn't any safe place for us. Uh, everything happened suddenly. Everything changed within 72 hours in Afghanistan. Uh, 
So I was, um, I have remembered that it was Saturday, um, it was Saturday we were off in Afghanistan, usually Saturday and Fridays. Uh, we received a call from our office. It was, you know, when you receive in the off days phone calls, you make you excited or make you an act worrying. That's what was going on. It's, they just call for all employees that come to the embassy. Uh, I was working with the U.S. embassy in Kabul, Afghanistan. Uh, come to the uh, office and uh, we have a, a meeting. So when we went there, we collected all the documentation from the office and we just burned all of them. So this uh, case was 72 hours before the revolution that came in Afghanistan. So when we came back home um, for the next day, it was Sunday, we were all, uh, we supposed to go back to work, but we received in the er very early morning that you should not come to the office anymore, you should be at home. And the next day I was in a sleep when I got up, when I saw the social media that everywhere was spread at the Taliban, even in the, in the presidential palace, the Taliban were there. I shake my head twice, that, is it true that they came or it is something wrong. I called from my mom, from my dad, that said, is it true? They said, yeah, it is true. So that's why um, um, so we have received uh, again, contacts and emails from office. They said, you have to be at home till we should uh, make transportation to carry you guys out from Afghanistan. And uh, at the first stage that uh, it was um, August, for 15 or 16, I exactly forgot. Um, they call us to come to the airport and go to, we were going to the US. So when we came, it was millions of people were there at the back of the gate and they all rushed to go inside the airport and come out from Afghanistan. But it was impossible uh, to come. Even my, my wife was, uh, she couldn't control herself anymore because it was so burning and also sunny very hard time. So we came back home and we stayed eight days more in Afghanistan at home. And I was worrying any time that maybe the Taliban came and maybe the friends, you know, when you work with the United States, you will find in Afghanistan. So enemies a lot because they're not agree to work with them. They're saying that these people, but they're not Muslim. And that's not true that they work with them. So I'm afraid a lot, but successfully on August 24th, we came out from Afghanistan and we came here. And I'm so happy that when I came here, and still we, we spent a lot of tough time uh, because we spent three months inside the base. That was very tough for me and my wife. Um, so when we came out, uh, we start our new life, new culture, new people here around. And I'm very happy that I work with the Refugee Dream Center. And I work for the people here as a case manager. When I'm working with them, any help that um, happen every day on my hands for the people, I'm so happy. And Refugee Dream Center, as Haiti told us, is a post resettlement of agency for refugees. and we working here in different um, programs and different to help for the people and youth program, ECL, ESL, sorry. And uh, we have uh, uh, case management. Uh, so these programs that we work every day with that for the people to help them. Uh, I'm so happy. Thank you so much, Savan. And we have a couple of questions coming through the chat. Um, let me see, Isabella Fortunata or Zayada. Uh, Joshua is asking, you know, how difficult was it for you to gain access to healthcare, food, housing when you first arrived? Uh, we heard from uh, Dr. Omar's video that the Refugee Dream Center picks up 
where government services leave off. So talk to us about how you found the Refugee Dream Center. Um, and Joshua is also asking, you know, what aspects are most challenging about getting settled here? What are the kinds of supports that you need? So help us understand what is that transition like uh, coming here? Uh, Isabel, would you like to answer? Okay. Uh... Coming here, I arrived, uh, my, I say, my name is Isabel. I'm a refugee from Angola. And uh, I flee my country during the civil war that lasted 24 years. And I spent 17 years in a refugee camp before I was resettled to United States in 2015. Coming to United States, it was a, a very excited mo exciting moment. And when we arrived here, after two, year, two months, we got a job, me and my husband. And unfortunately, we, we, we lost the medical insurance, was canceled. And that moment, because we didn't know the importance of medical insurance, we stayed a few, some months without medical insurance and I got very sick. I was admitted at the emergency room for four days and I'm paying that bill until today. After that is when I saw that there was a need for me to do something. I started thinking about also other refugees, what they are going through. I was a refugee in Namibia, and the Namibia is a country that the official language is English. I could speak English, and people could at, at least, even, even if I could speak with an accent, but at least people could understand what I'm saying. And I started thinking about other fellow refugees. I started going to commit engagements. I started going to, I started volunteering for the Refugee Dream Center. That's when I met Dr. Omar Bach through a survey he was doing about health promotion when he started the program for health, mm -hmm. health promotion. And uh, I volunteered for two years. And after the two years, I got employed as a case manager at the Refugee Dream Center. There are many challenges go, people go through, many challenges. Especially after the three months of assistance, then you are left on your own. You don't know where to start. You have, they have to, within three months, they teach you how to pay the bills. You have to set up your appointments. You have to call to answer calls. It's impossible for somebody who never spoke the language. That's why the Refugee Dream Center was funded. And we help even the, simple, the simplest thing that's to write, read a letter. Somebody, if she gets a letter, needs somebody to translate. We also teach the people how to pick up their calls. For example, if you don't know who is calling you, you don't have the number, the contact. Can you please leave it? Don't answer. We are going to, they are going to leave a message and you bring the phone and then we can and that, uh, translate what was said. That's, those are the simple things that we do here and they are really helping the people. People go through a lot of challenges a lot of challenges, especially paying the bills is something that no refugee where is coming from ever pay the bill. Either you are staying in the refugee camp or in the uh, urban refugees, they never pay the bill. And then they come here, they have to start paying bills and that's what we are helping at the Refugee Dream Center. Thank you. Isabel, thank you so very much. Um, Suban uh, Fortunata has shared uh, how long she had been in a, a refugee uh, for 21 years. Um, you know, I just want to honor the journey that you're sharing with all of us. You're helping us to understand because many of us are community health workers. We are outreach workers. We provide services, um, but many of us may have not engaged a refugee um, in the United States. They may be in our community, right? But sort of hidden. And uh, I know that Joshua was asking a question, Danina was asking a question, how we can better understand and make those connections. There are many others on this call who are immigrants um, from other countries. They may not have been refugees, but are immigrants and can share uh, some of the experience of the cultural barriers, the language barriers, the social barriers, not understanding some of the basic ways of navigating these services. Um, let me turn to Zayada 
Um, if you would like to share for a few minutes, talk to us about uh, who you were, the life that you had and the life that you now have here um, and what you're, you're doing. And thank you so much for being on the call. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Um, hello everybody, I'm Ziaga. Uh, I am a former refugee from, refugee from Iraq uh, and, and I came to the United States in 2018. Um, the reason I came here, you know, I had like every other refugees, normal life until the war started back home. Uh, that was in 2003 and we had, uh, we had ISIS, we had insurgents back home. It wasn't safe. Uh, at the same time, I was working as interpreter or uh, translator also uh, for the government agency. And um, I had the chance, I was lucky actually to have the visa and come to the United States with some family member. Um, coming to the United States is not easy because you are from different countries country, totally different culture, totally different system, especially the health system. Um, and if you speak the language, it's not easy, even if you speak the language, but how about those who don't speak the language? It's totally difficult for them. And when it comes to our job here is, you know, we are refugees from different, different ethnicity. I'm from Iraq, we have people from Syria, Gambia, Somalia, Afghanistan, and you name it. And our job is not only making bridges between the refugees of, I mean, among the refugees, ethnicities, like different refugee ethnicities, but also uh, building bridges between uh, the refugees and the American society here, which is totally different from what we have back home. For example, the health system. Um, Back home, we don't have this system that you have to go check every six months. You have to do the appointment. You go, like uh, my other colleague said, you go to the doctor only when you are sick, but here is difference. It's difficult for the refugees. So that's why we are here helping them make an appointment, um, helping them get a job. If they, they don't drive, if they don't have a car, we drive them to place of um, appointment. And as interpreter, because I speak English and Arabic, for those Arabic community, I even help them with interpreting. I make sure they know everything. I make sure I check on the client, um, take their medication, follow up with their appointment, the next one and so on, until they become familiar with the system. We still have, have refugees who still need um, help with appointment, interpreting everything. And um, during COVID-19, as a refugee dream center, we have been super busy. You know, it was a difficult time. And um, what we do is we make sure we, we call our client, we make sure they're okay. We make sure um, they have food. If they don't have food, we um, just do distribution. We drop the food at their houses and, you know, stay away until someone take um, the supplies we give them, whether food or supplies, anything. And even there were times, um, because refugees, there are certain food they don't eat. They cook their own food, most of them. They are, some refugees are not, um, they don't like, for example, canned food. There are times we could not accept donation or supplies from other um, people. So what we do, we used to do, we go and buy the food ourselves and distribute it to our client. At the same time, um, so when we follow up with them, we also help them uh, do appointment to get the vaccine. And uh, at the at first phase of um, COVID-19, get the test, the vaccine, the booster shot, you know, help them, direct them, make appointment for them. And many times we drive them until um, they get vaccinated or get tested, everything. Um, it's not easy to be an refugee, you know, being from different country, totally different one, especially when it comes to health system, education system, everything. 
Um, so we are doing our best and we continue to help refugees as long as they need us. Thank you for having me. Oh my goodness, thank you so much. And, and people are saying this is amazing and great information. I don't know if you're following the chat, but I just want you to know that people are really taking in what each of you are saying um, and that it's, it's very important um, and they're, they're leaning in. You know, some of what I've heard, uh, Dr. Omar talked about how we pick up, the Refugee Dream Center picks up where the services stop, these three month services. Um, and, and many of you talked about that. Um, you know, um, Teddy talked about how once you're a refugee, you don't belong to any country. And that struck me in, in such an incredible way. I just want that to sink in for a moment for people to think, she said there are 79 million uh, uh, refugees. Um, and we know that that number is growing every day uh, because of wars, uh, economic uh, issues in countries, uh, because of climate change, uh, because of uh, politics. There are so many reasons um, that people uh, become uh, refugees. Uh, and then of course, Zaida talked about our job is to build bridges from refugee communities to the US society. Uh, just, and she talked about all the different layers of that. Um, I know earlier, Teddy talked about the fact that that rich food, sweets and cakes and things like that in her country in Gambia were like for rich people. So imagine coming and being, you know, put into communities where you have corner stores or bodegas where all you have is junk food and canned food, right? That's all that is available in many communities and how unhealthy that is, um, but that that usually is the cheaper food. Um, so I wanna, I wanna um, have each of you respond to that sort of cultural shift, but also um, we, we're still learning about each of you. And Gloria was asking a question about how difficult it is to get children um, acclimated to the US experience. I don't know if any of you have children or if some of the refugees that you are working with have children, um, but as you're talking about building these bridges to the US society, how were you received by Americans? How were you received into the communities? Um, did you experience racism for the first time? Um, were you experiencing prejudice because of your faith? Um, and if you had children, how difficult was it to get children acclimated? So any of you can, can respond. Isabel, please go ahead. Yes, talking about children, when we arrive here, for children, this is a little bit more easier because they, they get uh, integrated due to go, they go to school and they, they get used to the American youth upon arrival. But for parents, it's difficult because, especially for parents who, 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 don't, uh, who don't go out, it's so difficult, and when they arrive here, the first thing they do, everything you are, you are like every you, you the life, the rough, the life of a person or a refugee starts here, and you are behind everything. Imagine somebody who comes here is already on his fifties or forties; he's already behind everything, and then you you want to to catch up on everything. The parents start working. The children they go to school didn't have that they, you don't have the time to 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 communicate. Sorry, I have a I have left the background. Yeah, you don't have time to to communicate. The parents they leave early in the morning, and they, they arrive at work from from work very late. And when they come, the children are sleeping. The children, they don't know what is going on with their parents. And then there's a disconnection between the parents and the children. That is, is when the problems start. And also the children, also they start, uh, when they go out, they, they want to belong. They want to show that, okay, they are not in a, 
Middle East, or they are not in Africa anymore. Now they are in America, they want to belong. And that is where cultural problems start between the parents, the parents, they want to, we want to keep our culture and the children, they want to learn, they want to belong on something new here. Thank you so much, Isabel. I was literally writing down <laughs> a lot of what you were uh, saying. Um, Zayada, uh, Subhan, um, do you want to um, come forward? And if anyone has questions, um, please feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, some of you are putting those questions in. I'm happy to read them, or you can just come off mute if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, Tiffany says, thanks so much for the explanation of the difference among different groups. I think she's uh, pointing to Teddy's presentation. Uh, Irma Marie says, excellent presentation. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Fortunata, what would you like to share? Yeah, my name is Fortunata Chantal Kasika. I'm a refugee from Democratic Republic of Congo. I've been in refugee camp in Tanzania for 21 years. I fled my country in 1996. Yeah. I want to intervene on, uh, on the issue of discrimination. Yeah. As far as job discrimination is concerned. Mm -hmm. I've witnessed the, some of our refugee community members, especially women, they have been discriminated on the job because of, of the language barrier. Most of the women, they, they don't speak English, write, even read English. They don't know anything about English. We used to take them to the job, especially the manufacturing job. And when they arrived there during job training, they just give them the people who don't speak their native language, people who speak English or Spanish. Now, when it's come to the job training, those people, they don't understand each other. People, they just come in rush. They show them you have to do this, 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 this. They don't understand. You may find them after one day, they are fired. One day, two days, they are fired. And those are, are women. They are married women, they have children, what well, they need to support them. So I can say that most of them, they are facing that is discrimination when it's come on the job because of language barriers. Myself, I faced some kind of job discrimination whereby I decided to quit that job voluntarily. I've been working on set on manufacturing job for one year and seven months without being hired. The reason being that I was advocating for my, my fellow black, especially those people who don't speak English. When they, they arrived in the company, I go to the team leader or the supervisor. I tell him, just give me those people. I'm gonna train them because we speak the same language. Mm -hmm. Now the supervisor said, why are you telling me that? Are you instructing me? Are you teaching me how to do my job? So they were reporting bad things to me. Everything, every day they were reporting me that I'm very aggressive, I'm, I'm not polite because I was advocating for my fellow African, especially those who can't speak English. Yeah, so they couldn't hire me. Imagine you work for one year and seven months without being hired then i've decided to to resign from that that work yeah fortunata thank you so much for sharing your story um because you're helping us to understand so much about how a family can come here and thrive and what might be um against them you know, you talked about the children and how they receive the other children. And you one can imagine because of the music or the play, uh, the laughter, the dancing, coloring, painting, playing sports, that it might be a little easier for children to come together. But this whole story 
about a family, parents who have to go out and work and have different hours and be away from their children and how that changes the family dynamic. The different culture is coming in, American culture, American food and dance and behaviors and how that can disrupt the connection of the family. So that's very powerful. You talked about the economics and all of this I'm drawing out because we have other CHWs here. We have program managers here. We have health providers. We may have executive directors here or other advocates who can help bring this learning into your community. What are these stories making you think about in terms of how you can make sure that refugees in your state, in your county, in your city have a place to land that when they meet you, they meet someone who is cute, humble, right? Who is going to be welcoming, who is going to help create bridges as Zayada said. So all of this is for our learning and our teaching. I wanna shout out Bin, Bintu Suso. I don't know if I've said it correctly. He said he's a fellow, fellow Gambian and he's here um, on the call. So I just want to acknowledge uh, him. Uh, Gloria is also asking about, she says she's working with a refugee family from Afghanistan that has a child that is special needs. I mean, these are all the layers of our experience that sometimes we forget. You know, it's not just about food and it's not just about clothing, right? But it's about bringing all of our needs um, into this new life and this new community. Um, so let's see. Also, I love what, um, what you were saying, um, Isabel, about advocacy. Um, and I, I think this is very important. Um, we were hearing Fortunata talk about advocacy as well. And the fact that when she was trying to help uh, the, you know, the employer to do the job better, to support other people from her country or culture, that she was seen as a threat because she was trying to advocate. Our voices as CHWs, we are here to advocate for the needs of others. And so we have to build those skills. Uh, one of our CHW leaders here, Danina, is in Atlanta, Georgia, and her job is advocacy. And she helps teach other CHWs to advocate. So we should help each other as CHWs. Um, let me see if other people have questions here. Kelly says there needs to be an advocate or teacher to different businesses when they're hiring refugees or immigrants on how to approach and teach. Yes, that, that is true. In your community, you can talk to the employers and give them some humility and help them understand how to be better employers um, for immigrants and refugees. Because it's not that they don't have skill, you know, we don't know, Suban, Zayada, Isabel, Fortunata, they could be nurses, they could have been teachers, business owners in their own communities, right? But coming here, we may assume that they don't have skill and expertise, and that's not true, right? They have advanced degrees, skills and expertise. It's just maybe a language barrier or a cultural barrier that is hindering them. So we have to talk to people and understand how they can bring their expertise into this new environment. Um, yes, Kelly, I would love to see CHWs in higher branches in politics. I believe Omar Ba is running for office right now. Uh, he's running to be a representative, which is so exciting in Rhode Island. So you can follow his a campaign and support that diversity coming into our communities. Uh, Fortunata says refugee families are facing housing discrimination due to large family households. Yes, 
a lot of people don't understand that we want to live in our extended families. It's not just mother, father, and two children. It can be aunties, uncles, grandparents, or our extended family that we're caring for. Um, and a lot of people, they discriminate in that way. So who else would like to come and share? I invite you to come off of mute if you wanna just encourage our speakers today. If you want to say something to Suban or Fortunata, uh, to Rakia, to Zayada, to Isabel, I just thank them so, so much for coming today. And yes, baforcongress.com is uh, in the chat right now. Um, would anyone else like to share what you're learning today? Has this opened your eyes? Let's engage. Let's thank our speakers. Uh, come off chat, uh, come off mute rather, and uh, share what you would like. Uh, yes, uh, Subhan. Um, again, I want to just uh, add for um, for your previous question that how you found uh, RDC Refugee Dream Center and also how was how was the difficulty of um, health uh, here and. United States and back home, it is completely different. Um, as Yana and uh, Isabel told that uh, Afghanistan, so when you became sick or you had a little bit uh, sickness, you could go very easily to see the doctor and without any appointment, without any, uh, for a head of calling or making an appointment. So here, and the United States, it is different. You have to make an appointment. It was very difficult. Still, I, I feel difficult because uh, I'm not uh, completely familiar with, uh, with all the hospitals and doctors how to make uh, appointments for myself because I don't know which, for example, if I get sick, how to find the doctor, where is the exact place? So maybe the appointment would be easy, but the source is there to find the source where I should go. Yeah, uh, but I'm happy to, at least uh, when I came to the United States, I, I know English to speak, but more refugees that they came from Afghanistan, they don't know English. It is very difficult for them to find a doctor to take travel there. So I feel it. So when I'm here in the Refugee Dream Center, uh, I'm so happy to help for my people, for, uh, for refugees, for other people, that I can support them. I, we can make for them appointment. So this is the difficulties uh, here in the United States. I hope that these um, should be one day take out for all people and that the people should uh, find their way easily. And, the first step that I advise for all the refugees, they should learn their, the language. Language is supporting for all the people. They, at least the 50 person, they can help themselves by finding. Uh, the, I wanna make share one more experience that I had here in the United States when we arrived. And the first, we went to the base. So for three months, it was a long time. When we reached out to Dallas International Airport, uh, they told us that maybe 14 days you will be in the, inside the base. But when we went there, we spent three months and 10 days. That's a long time. So what was the, uh, the good things and bad things, everything uh, we had experienced there. The good things was um, we didn't afraid anymore there will be blasting or someone will come and capture or kidnap us or maybe fire us. So these were not concerning anymore. But uh, the food, uh, even the food is good, was good, but you know, the culture is different. The people, they eat different kind of foods. And uh, for me and my wife, even for me, it was okay that because I was working with them, sometimes I tested that. But for my wife, that was the first time that she had these kind of foods. It was 
uh, I have remembered that for one week, she didn't eat anything, only uh, juice and also uh, fruit and uh, water. I tried to tell her, please eat. It is, it is base. We cannot buy anything when the people cannot come from outside to bring us. So she didn't eat because she said she was saying that I there is no test for me. How should I eat? If I eat this one, there is no test. So slowly she make habit for that food. Uh, right now, when we came out from the base, uh, she is saying that every time oh that food. Um, she has a lot of experience from the food, from the culture differences um, here. And I'm happy for my wife also. She is learning English language here. Um, and I'm also happy to work for people here in RDC, the Refugee Dream Center. Thank you so much, Saban. Lots of people are saying thank you for sharing. Okay. Uh, Shirley says, thanks for sharing your experience. It helps me to be more in tune to others, especially persons from uh, other countries. Um, Gloria says, I've learned so much from these speakers. Thank you. Uh, Ella says, thank you for sharing. I just want you to feel the love uh, people are responding, they are listening, um, they are receiving what you are sharing. Um, and Subhan, thank you for sharing just how different it was for you and your wife, even just ex um, experiencing the food. Um, many of you have, have talked about that um, and how, how different that was. Um, yes, uh, thank you uh, very much. So Fortunata, you have your hand up. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left, so we're going to be wrapping up soon. If you have not asked a question and you want to ask, um, or if you just want to come off mute and say thank you, uh, Fortunata, what would you like to say? Yeah, I would like to say a little bit about the housing discrimination. Yeah. Most of the refugees from especially Africa, they have a lot of, they, they have a lot of kids. So we are facing the house discrimination because of our alleged families. Like myself, as I put on the chat, in 2019, I faced housing eviction. After complaining to my landlord to repair the bathroom, he just gave me one month to vacate his house. But I thank my cash worker, he put pressure on the public housing authority and we were offered a five bedroom. Yeah. And it's not me. A lot of refugees who have big families, they are facing the same issues. Yeah. That yeah. was all I want to say. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you for that. And I think, um, you know, I just, first of all, a couple of people have mentioned that. Um, and I want to also say that. Uh, during the COVID pandemic, some of you know that there was an eviction moratorium uh, for people who had lost their jobs. Um, there was a, a stay of evictions um, that came uh, from uh, CDC. It was a recommendation uh, because they thought that that would contribute, obviously, to greater infections, uh, you know, hospitalizations um, uh, based on around COVID. But those moratoriums are going away. Um, and so many people may be uh, impacted by that. Uh, there was also um, uh, an opportunity during the pandemic for many people to access Medicaid. So Medicaid is based on um, your residency uh, in a particular state uh, and also uh, your income level. Um, so, for instance, in the state of Connecticut, where I live, uh, you had to be a resident for up to five years, and then you had to have a certain income, and you could get access to Medicaid, helping you to pay for health care services. Well, a lot of people right now are going to be losing their Medicaid eligibility, and they're going to have to redetermine. And so many people for the first time are going to have to now try and apply for these services. So there are many things happening right now. 
And let's add to that, yes, the discrimination by race because of your language or accent, um, because you don't understand the healthcare system and people are not helping you to navigate. Um, there, there is exploitation. People can take advantage of you. So it is very important if you are a provider of any kind of service and you're on this webinar, to think about how your services are reaching out to people who are experiencing vulnerability, okay? It's not that people are dumb. It's not that people are you know, ignorant. It's that people are coming from different cultures and just need to understand how to navigate these services, okay? Um, uh, Ariane, Ariana, Ariana, I'm not saying this correctly. Alma Guerre says, thank you very much for the conference. She says, I'm Cuban. Um, and if not only I, my community receives discrimination every day for not mastering the language and other things. Many feel afraid to seek help for fear above all of being deported. My God, thank you for sharing um, that message as well. Um, listen, people are experiencing vulnerability right now. The United States is the richest country on earth. And I know that there is space. We know that the money exists. We know that there are compassionate people in this country who want to connect people and help people. Look at the response to Ukraine. Obviously, we can come together, not only from our country, but many countries for a crisis. But we have to remember that there are people in this country experiencing crises. Okay, there are tribal nations in this country who are having difficulty accessing services. There are immigrants in this country, refugees in this country and all over the world who need help and support. And so for community health workers, we believe in the dignity and respect of every human being. We believe in social justice and racial equity for every human being. And so this is why uh, the National Association of Community Health Workers is doing this webinar. So that Isabel and Fortunata and Zayada, uh, Suban um, can share their stories um, and their expertise. So final word, um, Rakia, are you still on um, the webinar? I know your, your camera's been off. Rakia, yes, let me I'm just here. bring you forward as a deputy director, I believe, of the Refugee Dream Center. Um, all of your experts have shared today. And what I want to say, some people were asking, you know, where do refugees get training um, to become CHW so that they can help? Um, our association, the National Association, we have a national learning community just for refugees and immigrants. So I'm going to invite Isabel and Suban, Zayada, Fortunata, maybe they can be experts at our Unity Conference and speak more and help people. But what do you want to say in these final moments? Um, because we've been taught so much. What's the call to action? What should we do? What should we be thinking about, reading about? What's the next step for us? Well, I would always encourage continuous learning um, and staying open-minded to hearing from community members, um, facilitating conversations like this one. Thank you all for attending this meeting um, and always knowing that you can yourself can be an advocate for the refugee community. You don't have to be a refugee yourself. I, you know, I'm from Queens, New York, um, but it's it's been a really wonderful learning opportunity and um, I would just encourage staying on top of news. We all know what's happening in Ukraine. Um, 
and I think 100,000 Ukraine, Ukrainian refugees have been confirmed to come to the United States. Um, and remember that refugees come from everywhere uh, and we should always take an equitable lens to welcoming communities. Um, and actually, yes, I'll actually pass this on to Isabel. I think she's someone who is always great with last words. Um, she's a very powerful person. So Isabel, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Rakia. Yeah, I just want to say that uh, refugees, when they come here, they pay their own ticket, their own flight ticket. Before they, they, they get settled here, before they get integrated, they already have a bill to pay because it's a loan that is given to them and they have to pay the ticket back. Refugees are invited guests. The government chooses where they are for them to come for resettlement. They don't choose where to be resettled. And uh, also refugees are hard workers. When they come here, they want to work when they arrive. They don't depend on the handouts. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for, for sharing that, Isabel and Rakia. Thank you very much also for sharing. Um, Aurora, I know you are on the call. Do you want to just invite people um, who may want to connect to the National Learning Collaborative? Um, please, uh, Aurora Grant Wingate is one of our staff members. She's our member and partner engagement associate. We're grateful to have her. Um, and may, maybe some of you would like to stay connected to what we're doing. So Aurora, please. Yes, thank you so much, Denise. And thank you to all our presenters for being here today. It's truly been a great 90 minutes. Uh, as Denise mentioned, we are gonna have a learning collaborative uh, coming up on April 21st, which I would love to invite you all to. I will put the registration link in the chat. Um, this is a space for community health workers with different expertises and backgrounds to come together to talk about what's common uh, amongst what you are working on. Right now we have six different groups, one of which is focused on immigrants and refugees. Uh, and we would love to invite you to come uh, and meet other folks who are working on those same issues across the country uh, and learn from them. That's an ongoing new event. I'm gonna drop that in the chat and I hope to see many of you there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And in those learning collaboratives, you know, we're talking about policies. What are the types of policies that need that we need to help immigrant and refugees or our community health representatives on tribal nations? We're talking about the social determinants of health, but something that has come up in all of our learning collaboratives is the issue of mental health. So we have seen, of course, we understand when we hear that Fortunata, you know, that uh, Subban, that Isabel, that Zayada um, have come to the United States through great travail and challenge. They have been forced out. As a, um, um, as someone said uh, earlier, you know, we don't. Teddy said it's not that we want to leave. Uh, we have to leave uh, because of the environment. People are separating from their families, from their home communities, uh, from their culture, from their faith community, uh, and traveling thousands of miles to be here. Then in the midst of a pandemic, um, leaving uh, what is familiar and safe. Uh, so there are many mental health issues, the stress, the anxiety, uh, the desire to provide for your family, the difficulty in getting a job and getting housing, the mental health issues cross every community um, and they are compounded by the pandemic. So there are many things for us to discuss. We invite you to come to our learning collaborative um, and be a part uh, of figuring out some of these solutions. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining. Again, my name is Denise Octavia Smith. I'm grateful to have you here and share space with us. And again, I want to thank the Refugee Dream Center in Providence, Rhode Island, and all of the representatives who have come uh, today, Teddy, uh, Dr. Omar, Isabel, Zayada, Subban, um, Fortunata, um, and Rakia. 
I think that's everyone. Thank you for your time. Thank you for loving your community. Thank you for your service and your excellence um, in the service that you provide. And for everyone here, I pray that all is well with you and with your family and with your community. Please stay connected to the National Association of Community Health Workers. Take care, everyone. God bless.